Um, okay, so while people join, if someone else joins, I'm going to introduce myself. Some of you already know me, some others may not. I've, I'm Gemma. I'm the co-founder of this small initiative called the Silly Open Source Initiative. My background is in molecular biology, actually. So um, keep up with me if I don't use the proper technical terms. I learned, I'm a self-taught programmer, only learned, uh, I've only been programming actually for like one year, so I do my best. I'm not the main developer of the tool that I'm gonna present today. I'm um, more focused on the community engagement and all the scientific biological side of it because I did my PhD in the field of, of molecular biology actually. Um, but yeah, it's great to be here. And I kind of reformatted the whole thing. I was gonna do a demo more like Chris wonderfully did, um, but because uh, I was having so many interesting talks and thoughts um, today and yesterday at the sessions, I kind of last minute thought it would be more interesting for everyone to discuss some concepts around how do we bring tools that are developed in research in very high tech research environments to perhaps more the end users. So that would be someone like me a few years ago. And more interestingly to someone like me, but instead of being in an institute where I have access to data scientists and bioinformaticians and high computer, um, high power computers, et cetera, someone that is actually in a low resource environment and don't have access to these skills. So I think that it's a few of us, but I would still like to uh, you, if you can go in the document under these Google Forms, it's anonymous. If someone that is not comfortable filling this in, that's fine, but I'm gonna fill it in um, so that you, see what it says it's helpful for us to understand what kind of people um so to understand the feedback that we get if it comes from someone which background is it coming from so it's just a very easy um three minute questionnaire um so i'm gonna fill it in um you can fill yours i think you are now seeing still my screen so i come from the health sciences i work at a non-profit organization um, I am tempted to say I don't have strong community ties with any research uh, software engineering community, but because I'm a software fellowship, uh, software sustainability fellow this year, yes, I do, particularly in the UK. I have regular interaction with skilled researchers very much with our uh, with the end users of our platform. I'm participating here, so at least some of uh, workshops aimed at research software engineers. I've been both an attendee, uh, sorry, you cannot mark both in uh, workshops for non-experts. And because I contribute to software, I say yes. If you say no, that's all the questions you get asked. If you say yes, um, the end users of the software we are producing are health and biological sciences. We currently have about 100 users and I would like more interaction. Yes, I always like more interaction with end users. Um, okay, so that's it. I'll get all the answers and it just to give an idea of people that attend to our talks and see what are your interests. Um, so I give one minute so that everyone is on the same page if you answer the question. And then I'll give a short introduction of our tool. And I would like to use the last 10 minutes breakouts or if it's few of us, it can be on this on this room itself about a couple of, uh, I think very important questions that I would uh, really like to get feedback from people that is actually developing software um, because I'm very new to this field. Okay, so I think someone has joined, welcome. Um, let's dive a bit into what we are doing. I'll do like a small demo, but only presentation based because that will be easier. Uh, so we develop artificial intelligence and machine learning tools for infectious disease research. We are focused on this problem because if you look at the world as it as we represent it using the land area, um, we see, okay, this is the cartogram that we know, but then if we modify the country, okay, someone else, you know, if we modify the country size of uh, the different countries, according to the numbers of loss, uh, of, so the years lost of healthy lives due to communicable diseases, 
we see how this world is quite modified with the low and lower middle income countries here in purple and blue and being the most severely affected by this type of diseases, whereas these diseases have been um, eradicated or better tackled in, in many of the high income countries. And controversially, if we look at the number of scientific publications, we see how those countries that are mostly suffering from communicable diseases are actually almost not producing any research outputs. This is simply measured as number of, of um, publications. I think it's quite a good measure of the academic um, research uh, that is done in each country, sadly. And this leads to a clear balance imbalance in the research ecosystem, which lets, for example, in the healthcare sector that the drugs in development are mostly being developed for diseases that affect high income countries, whereas those diseases, that are communicable diseases that affect low income countries, there is less than 10% of the drugs that are currently in development that are tackling these areas. And this is partially because pharma industry is not focusing on diseases that have a low return on investment, but also because researchers in those countries lack the resources to tackle their, their areas, their region's needs. They lack both infrastructure, including digital infrastructure. They also lack funding and they also lack training opportunities in, in new fields such as data science. What we do at Ercilia to try to bring our small contribution to solve this problem is to strengthen the research capacity around neglected and communicable diseases in low and income, middle income countries by lowering the barrier to access computational tools. Computational tools, we are very focused on AI ML models, but also other types of data science or analysis. We also do, we also support our users with this type of analysis because they are cheap to implement. They are, they make research faster. They make they can help people to reuse data that they have already been produced. And hopefully this is a fast way to, to support research in, in low resource settings. We work based on three pillars. We, everything we do is free and open source. We try to share the code in real time as much as possible. It comes associated to permissive licenses and, and no patents. And we hope that this makes it more reproducible and also easy to use by anyone in the world. We try to avoid what is called the helicopter research, meaning that we don't um, we don't retain the scientific leadership of of the projects we participate in. We are a support group. We leave this leadership to to the local research uh, institutes, and we um, always support implementation in situ, in person, if we can, of of our tools, including uh, the establishing sustainable collaborations and training some of the local scientists into how to use these, these new tools and, and how to deploy them in, in their institutions and in next projects and follow-up projects that may come from collaborating with us. Our main uh, asset is what is their Cilia Model Hub, which aims to, pro, to produce ready-to-use ready artificial intelligence models for biomedical researchers. And when I say biomedical researchers, just bear, uh, keep in mind that we are talking about people like I was a few years ago, I never type a single line of code. If I saw a command line interface, I would be scared and run away. Um, so it's um, we really need to keep in mind that many of the things that are being developed out there are great, but many people that would benefit from using them can actually not use them. So what we do, okay, most of you may be familiar with this. So you start with raw data that needs to be processed. That's probably experimental data from a collaborator. We train a model. Uh, test how this model works, validate it. If, if possible, we validate it externally or experimentally in the field if there is if that's an option. And then what we add, and the, this is something that is not really well covered in academic research as it is now, is a deployment layer, which means that a scientist that finds this model interesting for uh, his or her research can come with a question, for example, a particular natural product, select the model, input his or her natural product and directly get the output, for example, the prediction of activity against a specific pathogen without the need to really understand what is going in, in inside here. Um, we have three types of main, three major types of models within our hub. So in one hand, we collect models from the literature. These are open source models that are developed by other researchers. This may be some of you, if you, if you work in, in this field. In this example, this very nice paper that, in, that developed a, a model to predict antibiotic activity of, of new molecules. 
and they discovered this halicin, which is a very potent antibacterial. So now our researcher should select this model in our hat, input the molecule, and get the prediction of active or inactive. Mm -hmm. And then second, um, we look for interesting data sets that have been um, generated and opened via PubChem, Campbell, or other, other repositories. And then we train our own models using this data in order to fill gaps that we see that our collaborators are missing. So in this case, this is um, a screening to identify antimalarial uh, drugs. And we have taken this 10,000 molecule data set, trained a model on it. And basically now if you input a new molecule, in this case, that Ovacuan analogs were discovered thanks to this, um, to this publication, you get the output of whether it's active or inactive. And perhaps and most important and central to our mission is that we partner with researchers and institutions and we develop models that use their specific data to answer their, um, their questions and support their research in a more uh, dedicated manner. And then these models are then also open source for the rest of the, of the research community that may want to use them. So this is a, um, an image, ideal image of the hat. So we have uh, different models. You select one, each one um, is, is linked to its original author, if it has an uh, original author, and that is not Ercilia, the GitHub repository where the code is living and a summary of, of the model. I'm adding this here because uh, we were very lucky to um, have a software sustainability health check last year when we just, um, when we were just finishing the basic infrastructure of the hub. So we were able to incorporate some of their suggestions into it. Okay, so before I finish, I wanted to do a short demo. As I said, now I'm to save time. I'm gonna do it just like this. This is our uh, main code repository. Um, you basically need to install it if you have Ubuntu or Mac uh, systems, that's quite straightforward and the packages work. If you have a Windows for the moment, it needs to be installed on a Ubuntu subsystem or on a virtual machine. And once it's installed, you can um, look at our models. There is a browsable catalog that is linked on our GitHub. It's currently about 40 models and we aim to reach 100 before the end of this month now that we are entering into production, production mode. And the problem, not problem, but the main barrier that we face now is that it's still on a command line um, based system. So there is no graphical user interface, which may be a barrier for adoption for some of our users, but we are also working on this. And simply then you can select the model um, so it looks like this. So you just fetch your model, predict this is a chemical structure. Uh, I think that's adrenaline. And then you just close the model. Um, this is in testing mode, but because we are, uh, we have a, a now open it really for contributions. We have outreachy applicants, if you know this program that are contributing to it now. Um, and they have, most of them has, have been able to install and run some of our models. This is how it actually looks when you run in a command line, in our command line interface. So, so the hub is, is ready to be open to the community. Um, we're still working on the graphical user interface design and so on, but what we are really focused um, on is, okay, let, sorry, I missed this slide. So to summarize everything I've explained, we are developing open source tools for biomedical research. We have a strong focus on making, on deploy them in a user-friendly manner. We um, live thanks to other open source and open data, um, and open data uh, repositories. So we all, everything we do, we also try to open source um, to benefit the rest of the community. We work uh, very closely together with researchers in the field. Um, who do data collection, and then we support their research projects um, uh, with our tools, or we develop tools that are specific to their needs. And then we also interact with the broader scientific community because our infrastructure is quite adaptable. So if you've attended the Lightning Talks, um, and there was one about uh, making kind of a similar model hub, but for astronomy. So we had an interesting talk of how our tools could be adapted to other purposes that is not um, specifically health research. And, and because uh, anyone can use them and they are user-friendly, everyone can use these assets. 
And we also think it's quite interesting for researchers that are actually actively developing models to use our hub as a way to put models for increasing its visibility, its usability, and, and so on. So this is what I wanted to present before we move into, a, I think we have 15 minutes to discuss some things, but um, perhaps I can take questions first is if um, there are, let me check the document or Mario, if, are there any questions you can like just unmute yourself and, and yeah, jump in. No, you don't have any, as far as I can see, no, no questions in there, in the document, so you, okay. you can, you can so open up. I either, I either went very fast or. <laughs> can, can okay. I ask I one question? Yeah. For you? Um, so you mentioned uh, before, and this immensely resonated uh, when you said about the, that the command line is inaccessible. And then you said you were working on the uh, on the graphical interface. And could you expand a bit more about what you're doing to to bridge that? Um, yes, yes, that that's a very good interface question. divide. We are doing two things. The first thing is um, we have one volunteer um, that is that is going to help us devise a graphical user interface um, that will be so with like uh, that will be web-based probably, but you will still need to download the models in your computer, which is also a main barrier for adoption if you still need to install the hub. So mm, we don't want to do too much work in this direction because we think that the people that will really download the hub and use the models are people that are perhaps uh, a bit more um, into coding already, into data science, because some of the models that we have are actually, um, so we have N models, as I said, you just input a molecule, you get whether it's active or inactive, but we have models that we also use to develop our own tools. So for example, models that convert a molecule into a specific fingerprint or descriptor that then you can um, use in a secondary, um, in, a sec in another step of, of, of AIML. Mm, and so what we are really focused now is trying to deploy our models online. So to make them lighter, and if we get enough funding to, to create an online hub in Amazon cloud. So that would be the solution because we feel that when the hub needs to be installed, um, it's really a big barrier for people that are not experts. Even if it's, they ha it has a graphical interface, like the packaging, the packaging we would need to do to make it really easy to install and use is, is a lot. So we prefer to go for the online option if, if it's possible. Yeah, we are working on that right now. Yeah, I can definitely understand our uh, uh, adoption went up by, you know, 4,000% uh, when we switched from desktop to, yes. to web-based. Yes, so we are, we are actually now setting up the infrastructure and we'll test it with 10 models and then we'll see if, if we move forward with this. And um, any other questions? Okay, so now it's really the floor is open for a discussion. So it's just to get your feedback or ideas. Um, we have a, because we now, we are now at the stage uh, that our software works, that we have uh, implemented it in, a, in one research institute and we are starting a collaboration in a second one. Um, and everyone is very happy. Um, they are really excited about being able to use all these tools. So we have very good feedback, but to make these things sustainable, we are a very small team. We are a nonprofit. Most of us um, actually volunteer our time because we don't have enough resources yet. Um, so something that we really need to do to make this sustainable, very much in line with what we were talking today is to um, on board contributors that are simply interested um, in deploying their models. For example, this is a way of expanding the hub. Um, many, many researchers now, they realize they need to make their models usable. So what they do, they publish a paper and they make a small website um, that needs to be maintained and to run their specific models. So we would, um, I think our hub is a good substitute for that. So the model I presented on antibiotics 
is developed by MIT and they do have a small website that runs this model specifically, but then you need to go website by website to find all the different models that are deployed. Um, so they have put uh, encompass all of this. So here I have some questions. Um, some have been tackled in other discussions um, with, uh, for example, Stephen, but we are, um, my first question is about the bottle, about con model contribution. So not everyone can afford to volunteer as a contributor to open source. Some people have the resources and the time and the, their positions allow for it, some others don't. Um, so we are not clear on how to make contribution guidelines. I think it, this is a very general problem to many open source projects, but in our particular case, we are very worried about um, whether we should establish some ethical guidelines or what checks should we do on model depositors. So the question is, do we just open this for anyone that wishes to add models um, or should we, what concern should we take into account when opening this? <laughs> I don't know. Okay, now I was gonna, I was gonna suggest we do breakout rooms, but it's very few of us. So I think we can just stick to here. Yeah, just jump off mute and and, and yeah, just and just speak, speak it. So save yeah. yourself for typing. <laughs> So I think you've mentioned that you do your, your development stuff on GitHub, and I think there are some stop gaps already built into GitHub that will help you um, accept contributions and then vet them afterwards. Like if you ask people to only contribute in a fork and put up a pull request, you, you know, it's your choice whether to merge it or not. You can run all the reviews you want to on that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I take it people that develop models would be or could be somewhat familiar with general development workflows and would not be put off by something like, you know, a guideline asking them to put up a pull request. Um, and I think that may, for the, at least for the time being, could be a good um, way to do this just to get started until you figure out what, what issues you may have. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay, yeah, that's good to know. We are a bit scared of opening it to everyone, also because um, we haven't worked so much in the open source domain. Um, so it's our real first time uh, doing this. And yeah, when I, I mean guidelines, we also think about, um, are there any specific model like, ethical guidelines, how do we check that the models have been developed following good scientific practices, that the data that has been used to train the models is actually good quality data or not biased. So we don't know if we we have discussions whether we should simply be, um, a bit what I was mentioning to Stephen the other day with this citation file format, we just provide the tool, people can use it, it's up to them, um, it's not our responsibility or we need to put some checks. Um, so that's a big, a big thing. Do we want to become managers or we just produce this infrastructure and we welcome anyone that wants to use it? Use it. It's a difficult... Um... Gemma, if, if I may ask, uh, because your question is very much if there is a model that is let's say unethical, which uh, is, is quite an ambiguous term. Like I would reverse the question and ask what are the values you want uh, the submissions to hold up to? So what I hear is um, sort of either unbiased or at least uh, cognizant of it and, and, and then some other aspects, but maybe reasoning from those values, you could also figure out what the questions are that you would need to ask to figure out whether they uphold those. And then you can immediately see, you know, if you know that a data set from which a model is trained upon is clearly biased towards white people, for example, you could say, okay, that's not for uh, in, a, in line with our values. So models based on this data set, if they don't do anything additional, no. Um, and then you have a strong base from which to go from uh, 
even if you have unknown models or submissions that come in in the future, which might raise, of course, new questions, but um, to really be yeah. value driven in that. Yeah, that's that's a great suggestion to like start thinking of the values rather because the use cases are um, yeah infinite. But that's that's a very good suggestion actually. Thank you, Chris. And then the last two minutes, and then we'll have to wrap up um, so that we are on time. Um, our main focus is to make research software more accessible to non to non experts. Um, we really struggle to create a closer community between research software engineers and end users because there is no incentives for them. There is very little incentives um, for a researcher that codes once the code has been published uh, to actually um, interact with end users, um, reach out to them. And this is something we want to tackle with the hub and the whole uh, initiative. And I don't know if any of you has experience of or examples of communities of this kind that we could draw um, examples from or ideas or contact them to, to understand. If it's a no, it's okay. It's a difficult question, but I had to ask. It's a, it's a very difficult, um, question for for the community and yeah um so i'm i'm not sure if there is actually such a strong boundary between rscs and end users um i used to work in linguistics for a long time and it's people all, all the people that we have uh worked with and collaborated with came from just a spectrum in between you know pure researcher and pure software person um i think the question is how can you keep these people close to the project people that you have found valuable to work with in the past um and this indeed is then a question i guess of incentives and i am at a loss to, about kind of how to answer this but um no, it's, a, you, it's, it's, it's a long running process, mm -hmm. building yeah, that kind very... of community. <laughs> yes, I think um, definitely you want to identify key persons that you want to, um, to keep. Um, when I mean the community between researchers and more software engineers, research software engineers, um, I think we are really biased, um, so the communities um, because we have the experience here in, uh, in well-resourced institutions, even myself, the communities that we serve, they literally, there is no computer science units in these institutions or very, very little. There is very, very little um, of these expertise around. So that, that's why you kind of need to outsource it, but you don't want to outsource it. You want to create a community so that these skills start to be really transferred and then you'll get the spectrum that we have here. But many of the countries that we are trying to reach, they really don't have this spectrum as of yet. So it's a bit creating the community means creating this spectrum of, of a more wide range of, of experts. But thank you for the, yeah. Um, okay, so I think that's it because it's three minutes, uh, 23, 24. And we were told to finish very much on time. So thank you for listening um, and helping us out. Uh, if you stay, if you check our GitHub, now it's a bit crazy because we have a lot of outreach applicants trying to make contributions, which is nice, but it's also a bit stressful. Once this period is closed, we'll reopen new issues um, for any contributions. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for doing this, Kema. Uh, so if we can give her a, a virtual thank you kind of thing.